Welcome to Tough Talk. I'm your host, Paul Terrace, and today my guest is State Representative Jim Tedder. Jim was first elected to serve the 43rd House District in November 2014. Now in his second term, Jim serves as the chair of the Tax Policy Committee, as well as the vice chair of the Health Policy Committee. He is also a member of the Energy Policy and Communications and Technology Committees. Jim was elected by his peers to serve as Associate Speaker Pro Tem as part of Tom, Speaker Tom Leonard's leadership team. In June of this year, Jim announced his candidacy to serve as the next state senator for Michigan's 12th Senate District. The seat is currently held by State Senator Jim Marlowe, who is term limited. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me on your show today. So I have to ask you, you were elected the uh, Speaker Pro Tem. Have you had a chance to fill in for Speaker Leonard yet? I have not. I'm the Associate Speaker Pro Tem, so Lee Chatfield Oh. is the speaker pro tem and oh, then there okay. are two two associates gary glenn okay. out of the midland area and myself and so yeah there are there are in fact several occasions where i've had the opportunity to preside over session oh well very good yeah yeah that must have been quite the experience yeah it's uh it's 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 a lot of fun but it can also be stressful depending <laughs> upon what bills are being taken up at any given time how contentious they are but usually in those moments, uh, the speaker is the one holding the gavel. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of bills, as your term as a state representative, um, what are a couple of the bills that you're most proud of uh, voting for? Well, I would say uh, the bills I'm most proud, most proud of aren't necessarily ones that have made it across the finish line, interestingly enough, because philosophically, uh, these are these are concepts that I that I strongly strongly believe in. Um, the first was the number one bill out of the gate this year, and that was House Bill 4001. And what that bill sought to do was to bring back the income tax in line with where it was in 2007. And yes, sadly, um, here to here to say that. The, the promise of a temporary tax cut um, has not been fulfilled. And so uh, the Associate Speaker Pro Tem Lee Chatfield, who was the main bill sponsor, and myself as the chairman of the Tax Policy Committee, we worked diligently to get that tax relief across the finish line. And um, at the end of the day, we're still uh, a few votes short in getting that out of the House. But I remain committed to achieving a real and meaningful income tax uh, uh, reform. I'll also go back and give you a second example, and that was when I was first elected in 2014. I, I come from an education background, both as a civics and history teacher, but also as a school administrator. And one of, one of the frustrations that I often shared with my colleagues is that even though we have many bright students graduating from our schools here, in Oakland County and across the state, regardless of grade point, many of those students are walking away ill-prepared to, to make everyday decisions in the financial realm. And so, although high school students are required to take a one-half credit of economics for graduation, which is more of a theory-based class, many students were left um, ill-prepared, as I mentioned, to address things like, you know, balancing a checkbook, uh, searching, uh, shopping for a mortgage, learning about interest rates, learning about credit cards, the risks and benefits involved with credit card usage. And so understanding that that was one of the issues uh, we faced in our schools, I sponsored legislation that ultimately led to the passage of a bill that allows students to take a personal economics course 
in lieu of the traditional economics course to satisfy their graduation requirements. And while it's not the panacea, it's not going to fix everything, what I think it does do is acknowledges that we need to do more in our schools to promote financial literacy in the classroom. And that bill did get passed? Or? It did. Um, with flying colors, I believe it was a rare unanimous uh, moment of support in the House, likewise in the Senate, and then it went on to be signed by the governor. Yeah. So just an, another tool, another option for our schools and for our students of the state. Okay. Um, you also helped pass Senate Bill 242, otherwise known as the Good Jobs Bill? That's correct. Um, now, um, you know, my personal feeling on that bill is it kind of smells a little bit like crony capitalism. Only a few developers are going to get the benefit of that bill? Yeah, I will, I will tell you, Paul, uh, philosophically, I'm with you on, on, that, on that broad front. That's the default position that I always approach when I'm, when I'm looking at, at bills like the Good Jobs for Michigan bill. And, uh, but as, as tax policy chair, we, we held hearings, we held testimony. I heard from my township officials. I heard from good folks like Matt Gibb, um, works under Brooks Patterson at the county level, that this was, this was important for, for not only supporting the development of, of projects and creation of jobs here in Oakland County, but really across the state. I would, I would argue that at the end of the day, this bill package allowed for communities big and small to, to benefit, and I think we'll 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 know here uh, in the you know in a very short period of time whether that's in fact the case. One of the things I'm very pleased of in the outcome of all of this is that we have a very very tight, very short sunset on this legislation. So by December 31st of I believe it's 20, uh, 2019, this will be sunsetted. And so, which will require the legislature to go back and say, was this broad-based, was this of benefit to companies of all size, of all stature, um, and decide whether or not we want to continue with this, we want to continue with this uh, good jobs package. And if I may, just back up and explain a little bit about what the Good Jobs Bill do, did. Because on, on the surface, it does appear that this is directly driven toward large, larger companies. So there were um, companies that would bring 250 or more new jobs to the state, would be able to capture part or in some cases all of the income tax from their employees for a given period of time. And so having said all that, there is a, there is a you know, multiplying effect that comes into play when you have companies that are tier one and tier two suppliers to some of these larger companies that likewise will benefit. So in hearing all of the testimony, I think it's fair to say that there were, there were businesses of all sizes and have varying levels of uh, benefit to this package that were supportive. You know, again, I, I seldom, if ever, support legislation that, that has this sort of potential impact without a sunset, because I think it's incumbent upon us to review these things periodically to decide if and to what extent they've been successful. Okay, but the, it also applies to larger uh, businesses, like I, I think bringing in 3,000 jobs? They Correct, yeah, there's, there are three levels. As I said, 250 or more. There, uh, there's a level of 250 or more jobs that have to pay at or above the market, the market rate for a given area. Michigan is divided into 10 prosperity regions. We are in prosperity region 10 here in, in Oakland County and in, in, in part of the southeast region. And so there's the $250 or 250 job threshold, there's the 500 or more job threshold, and there was a 3,000 or more job threshold, which likely, unless we land in Amazon or some equivalently sized business, 
we'll likely won't see that come into come to fruition. But that is true. Okay. Okay. Um, not, another bill, uh, House Bill 5013, which would reform Michigan's no fault auto insurance. Uh, you voted against it. Um, can you say why you didn't like that bill? Absolutely. You know, and the things that you learn on the job <laughs> really uh, evolve over time. I, I had really little interest or knowledge about the no-fault system until, frankly, um, I became elected. <laughs> and as such, knowing that this is an important issue to the folks um, within my district and across the state, we're all very sensitive to the, the cost of auto insurance. I voted no on House Bill 5013 really for, for not just one reason, but a myriad of reasons. First, I will offer to you that House Bill 5013 encompassed multiple sections of the insurance code. And so even though I may have liked a few provisions within the legislation, there were others I did not like. And as such, I was forced to decide, do I vote for this bill because I like a few things? and don't like more? Or do I, do I try and fight another fight and instead support legislation that, that does, in my opinion, directly affect the cost of auto insurance? And so some of those examples. Number one, we have the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association. This is a $22 billion fund, billion with a B, that the drivers of Michigan have been paying into for 45 years. And the challenge that I have is that the, the actuarial assumptions, the methodologies that, that are used to determine what that MCCA assessment cost is to each driver is very cryptic. And it's argued by the insurance industry that you know this would undermine their, their competitive advantage, which I'm not so certain that I agree with that. So I think first and foremost, we need to open up the fund. Number two, I think there's broad acknowledgement that we need a substantial fraud authority to vet out fraud, not only on the driver's side or the pedestrian who is feigning a fake auto accident, but also on the insurance side. To what extent are insurance companies denying claims you know, under false pretenses. So I think even though there was, a, there was a push for a fraud authority within the bill, I think it could have gone further and it, there wasn't a chance to vote for that separately. There's legitimate conversations about the, the amount that are paid on certain procedures. I think that's one of the biggest rubs for people is why is it that you pay, you know, three or four times more for an MRI, for example, under no fault than you do as, as someone that's a private payer off the street that hurt their, hurt their knee in a basketball game. And so there's legitimate conversation to be had about that. But again, there wasn't a, a general acknowledgement as to what the landing spot was on that amount. There's another area with respect to attendant care and how much and for how many hours in a day should we be paying into the um, attendant care piece of it. So we're talking about home health care providers. It could often be family members that are taking care of a, a catastrophically injured a loved one or family member. So again, an honest discussion about what, what, are, what are fair and appropriate rates there. So those are all areas I believe that we can work together on to achieve real and tangible savings. And I might say in all of this, had House Bill 5013 passed and, and gone on to the governor's desk to be signed, I'm reluctant to think that the Mich drivers of Michigan would really save anything. Um, I know in uh, you know, my neck of the woods in North Oakland County, our rates are actually quite reasonable and very competitive across the country. But when you, when you, when you bring Detroit into the mix, where, where the fraud is prevalent, the number of claims, are exponentially higher, the number of uninsured is higher, you end up with that, that population down in the Detroit area causing upward pressures on the rest of us as far as insurance rates go. So those are, those are a few reasons. 
um, you know, we could probably have a whole session on, on no fault because it is an important one. I think it's important that we continue the discussion. Well, it is important to get the right bill passed. You're, you're absolutely right. So um, now, now you're running for state senate uh, for the 12th district. What area does that uh, encompass? It's, um, it's quite an expansive area. It starts all the way up in the northern, northern part of north, northeast Oakland County. So we're talking about communities like Addison Township and Leonard, Oxford Township and the village of Oxford, Orion Township, city of Lake Orion, Oakland Township, Independence Township, Auburn Hills, Pontiac, Sylvan Lake, Kego Harbor, uh, Bloomfield Township and Southfield Township and the villages contained within. So it's a it's a pretty expansive district. Okay. Uh, now, is there any reason why you're running for a state senate? Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, I've um, I found my my three years to this point as state representative to to be rewarding. I think that I've been able to to serve as an accessible, accountable, and authentic voice to the people that I work for in the 43rd House District. And, you know, in the era of term limits, the, the one way that you are able to build upon the experience that you've gained and to be of better service to the people that you hope to represent is through pursuing a position in the Senate. And so there are, you know, frankly, I'm willing and I acknowledge the fact that I will, buy, I will be basically taking on the same job but doing so for triple the, triple the area, triple the geographic area. Um, few have worked as hard as me to this point. So I want to take the experience I've, I've, I've assembled to this point and I want to continue to apply it um, as the next state senator for the 12th district. Um, I'm someone that's pride myself on transparency and integrity. I'm someone that's a constitutional conservative and believes in protecting our first principles and our, and our Bill of Rights. Um, I'm also someone that's a strong advocate for local control, um, so long as it's not in, in defiance of our Constitution or um, a major disruption to commerce within our, within our communities. And so um, I think between, with my balanced background, my experience that, um, and the level of energy that's required to take on this role, um, I believe I'm, I'm the best and most qualified. And, and to this point, I, I remain the only, only candidate in the race um, that perhaps could change down the road. Okay. So you're the only Republican candidate who's filed? That is correct. Okay. Uh, what are some of the major challenges facing the state that you see? I would say without, without hesitation, health care is one of the greatest challenges facing our state. And I, and I say health care with respect to the exorbitant cost. And I tell you, when I, when I ran first in 2014 and, and continuing ever since reaching out to people, um, through my office hours, through, through knocking on doors, universally most working people will tell you that they are experiencing double digit increases in the cost of health insurance. I'm reluctant to believe that the Affordable Care Act under the Obama administration has led us to this point. It's not, it's, you know, uh, the proverbial nail in the coffin, if you will. And I believe that we need to, you know, encourage some bold leadership at the congressional level to do something about it. I also think one of the great, uh, great perils uh, involved here in Michigan was the passage of Medicaid expansion. And on one side, we, we can acknowledge that we've got 650,000 new people covered that may not have otherwise been covered. But the question for me is, as that, that has happened at what cost? Um, and I think that cost has been substantial. And so I think we really need to do a completely different uh, look or deep dive into the exorbitant cost of health care. 
Another challenge facing us, and I'm really pleased to have been at the forefront a lot of these conversations, is, is doing what we can as a state and community by community to, to reinvigorate the skilled trades base in this country. And I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a proud product of two working class parents. I'm the first in my, first in my family to go to college. And, but I, I gotta tell you, uh, my late father and um, my mother are two of the smartest people I know, although they're college, high school educated. Um, my dad worked uh, you know, as, as a laborer for General Motors and, and through that job, he was able to provide us uh, you know, a, you know a, uh, an adequate upbringing, an adequate, uh, an adequate uh, living. And so, th likewise, there are a lot of skilled trade jobs available that aren't being filled. Um, in part, our economy is doing better, but this is a problem that has preceded the good economy. And we need to do more within our schools, from elementary and middle school on up, to reinvigorate our skilled trade space. Okay, Go, going back to the health care, um, isn't it costing the state four billion dollars? In um, well, the Medicaid budget, as it, at, in a, as um, in uh, in aggregate, costs the state nearly eighteen billion dollars, and so that is um, nearly thirty three percent of our budget. Now, understanding some of that's "quote unquote" federal money, I argue that's our money we send to the federal government, and they, uh, in some cases, uh, send it back. Um, there is no question that the the upward pressures on the Medicaid system are in the into the in deep into the billions of dollars, and um, Medicaid's expansion contributed to that. And you know, my predecessors that supported that legislation when uh, when asked one of their responses was well if and when we have to start we as the state of Michigan have to start paying our five percent or ten percent contribution to the cost of of Medicaid then we can just bow out of it well as you and I uh, begrudgingly know there have been few social welfare programs in the history of this country that have ever been rescinded once implemented. And so I think that was perhaps a, a dishonest sentiment that if we at some point are forced to impose greater burdens on our budget by paying into the Medicaid uh, system that we would just back out of it. That's clearly not the case to this point. Okay. Um. What's your view on our infrastructure? I well, I think it's it's <coughs> excuse me. It's fair to say that our our infrastructure remains challenged. It was um, unfortunately a problem that I inherited. You know, we hadn't really invested anything in our infrastructure of significance since the you know mid 1990s. So I believe that we still have an infrastructure challenge. You know the um, the legislature and the governor did uh, put forth a package not long ago, as you know, and um, I don't think that there's an appetite to do more unless we're willing to to make some tough decisions and take money from other areas and place it into roads and infrastructure. I'm heavily supportive of that. You know, Governor Snyder, um, and he should be bragging about this is you know, is touting the fact that perhaps by as early as the next vote on the, uh, the next budget, that we will be looking at a billion dollar surplus, which is a far cry from, I think, the $2 million that Jennifer Granholm had when she left office. And so I would argue, let's, let's take 300 million of that. Let's find common ground on something we all agree on, and that is that we need more investment in our roads and infrastructure and let's take some of that surplus money and put it where it'll have the greatest impact on the greatest number of people, and that would be our roads and infrastructure. Okay. What do you um, think of Common Core? Well, I ran, I, uh, I ran against Common Core. I'm a, I'm a former educator, and I remember 
sitting down with my, my social studies colleagues in our civics textbook, and way before Common Core even had a name, we were being asked to align you know, our lesson plans to those standards. Now, I might, I might acknowledge that the standards in and of themselves, if you, if you read them, they're at least within uh, the scope of the language arts standards, seemingly benign. The challenge and, and the pushback I have is that if, if a local school district likes these standards, then you know, let, let the school board and the superintendent decide to adopt these standards, but to do so in a mandated fashion, I think, not only defies local control and local community-based decision-making, but I have a profound issue with two basically lobbying organizations, the, the, the Council um, of State School Officers and the, and the uh, National Governors Association having copyright to those standards. And so while we can have a broad-based discussion about what good, you know, what good standards look like, what, what a strong curriculum looks like in, in supporting our kids now and into the future, I, I believe that that Common Core is, was the wrong direction, remains the wrong direction. And um, the problem is the longer, the longer we wait to present an alternative solution, the harder it is to repeal because there are a lot of school districts that will now tell you, well, we've invested X amount of dollars in complying with this, this new law of the land and, um, and now you're asking us to change again. So we need to be swift and nimble. I have been a co-sponsor of legislation, while not perfect, sought to uh, repeal and um, replace Common Core with something more more objective and more beneficial uh, to our locals. Okay. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, what, what's your uh, opinion of smart meters? You know, I, I have one on my home, but I also, I also support, I support and acknowledge the, the position that many people have in opposition to them. I know I, I don't feel qualified or um, even willing to disagree that some people may in fact have health related issues from that. Others perceive it to be um, a privacy issue um, as these meters can and may aggregate usage data. And so I, I fully support philosophically uh, where people are at there. Um, I think uh, you know, as we get into the millennials and, you know, the populations age out, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the younger people have less concern than, than those of us in, you know, 40s and 50s and beyond who are used to a different time and a different era. But, you know, um, currently there is, there are opt-out provisions afforded to people if they don't want to, if they don't want to have um, a smart meter on their home that they don't they don't have to have one, and I will always um, I will defend that right for them to be able to to opt out from having a smart meter. Okay, but it, it does come at a cost. Those opt outs, right? It does. It does, and I and I acknowledge is, and I'm not part of like how the, the business model works for the utilities, but. Smart meters do allow for these these meter reads remotely, and um, there are I think a couple different options. You can have a meter reader come to your house if you if you don't have an operating smart meter, or you can self-report, which still requires an occasional visit visit from a meter reader to basically I guess keep people honest. And so um, I believe there is. Um, uh, ten dollar a month charge for that opt out, and so you know I I I don't know the exact number if that that number is high if that number is low, but I would acknowledge it's obviously more costly to to service a meter in person than it is to to do a remote um, report. Okay, um, it, it it might be more costly, but uh, 
you know, shouldn't you, as a uh, consumer, be assured that, you know, what's on your house is safe and isn't invading your privacy? And that, mm -hmm. that should be, you know, no yeah. cost to achieve those two things. Yeah, no, and I, I, I don't disagree at all with, um, with those two things, right? Safety, privacy. You know, um, you know, as I established a long time ago, I, I'm, I'm a strong advocate in, in supporting, you know, one's civil liberties, one's right to privacy, and, and, and on and on. And so that we can have an honest discussion, I think, about if there should be a cost, and if so, what should that cost be? You know, I think, um, I think over 90% of houses have a smart meter at this point, and they wouldn't likewise want to, if there is a subsidization involved, they would likewise want to subsidize the folks that wanted to opt out, I guess. So that's an ongoing, um, you know, certainly an ongoing debate and discussion. If there should be a fee, if so, how much, and if not, then we, uh, we can talk about that as well. Okay. Well, we're out of time. I hope you'll come back again, uh, maybe in the summer, closer Anytime, to the election. So I wish you luck. Yeah, thank you. Thank I you, appreciate Jim. your time.